disappointing. Uh, I wonder if perhaps you can hear me now. We're gonna give it a second and see if you can hear me. Um, there's a little bit of a lag. And so perhaps now? No, still no. Well, that is highly disappointing. Um, we're gonna try something different. We're gonna try, how about over here? Oh yes, oh, okay, all right, now it's on. Fantastic, let me start over, okay. <laughs> technology. So let me start over. Thank you again so much for joining me today to chat about CRISPR and CRISPR winning the Nobel Prize. So I was totally over the moon when I heard that Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier had won the Nobel Prize. Even though I had absolutely nothing to do with the discovery, I felt like I had won too. Um, just because it really felt like such a big win for the genetics community and because it's a technology that's really near and dear to my heart. So I'm really excited to talk with you all about it today. Uh, I have a whole list of questions that people sent in here on YouTube and on Patreon and on Instagram and on TikTok that I have compiled that I wanna go through, but please, uh, I wanna talk with you, not at you. So please jump in in the chat if you have any questions. Uh, I really wanna talk with you. So the first thing I want to do before I start going through this list of questions that people have sent in is that I want to sort of give a background on CRISPR. So at its most basic, when we talk about CRISPR today, what we're really talking about is a CRISPR-Cas system, but everybody just calls it CRISPR. And the idea is that there are two parts. There is a protein. Uh, goodness, YouTube is telling me that you might experience some buffering on the stream. I'm so sorry. I don't know what's going on with this today. Um, so there are two parts to CRISPR. There is an enzyme that acts like a pair of molecular scissors. And so what it does is it cuts DNA. And then there's another part that's a guide RNA that works with that Cas protein to find where it wants to cut. So the idea is that you can direct this Cas protein to a place in the genome that now encompasses everything from bacteria to yeast to human cells and cut in a specific location where you want to cut. And so this is really a revolutionary tool, but it's not something that we just sort of came up with and built in the lab. And I think the story of its discovery is really cool. So CRISPR is something that, uh... okay, good, people can still hear me. So CRISPR, was really first discovered in bacteria that have to do with yogurt. And so if you have yogurt in your fridge right now, there's probably a CRISPR system just hanging out in your fridge. So yogurt scientists were trying to make strains of yogurt bacteria, so the bacteria that sort of chews up the milk and creates yogurt, that could uh, be more resistant to phage. So bacteriophage are viruses that infect CRISPR. And so, They'd done this over a period of time, you know, if yogurt makers were having problems, they could send them new strains of bacteria, but it was like a really involved process. And what they found is when genome sequencing uh, came to be pretty cheap and they could do a lot of genome sequencing, they started sequencing the yogurt bacteria. And they found these weird areas of the bacteria that had these repeat regions of DNA, where the DNA had all these repeats over and over and over again. And so they called these clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats, which is a very long name, uh, but that's what CRISPR actually means, is it's these little repeats that they found in the bacterial genome. And in between these repeats is that they found these like nonsense sequences of DNA and they couldn't figure out what they did. But after a while, they figured out that those repeat sequences of DNA were actually pieces of this bacteriophage DNA, this like invading virus. So the bacteria was storing these pieces of invading viral DNA in their little CRISPR region. And they also found that this conferred a sort of immunity against these bacteriophages. So in the beginning, yogurt makers and like the makers of these yogurt bacterias, and the big one was Danisco, 
um, they were sort of immunizing bacteria against these phages. And the bacteria would incorporate that little piece of this phage into their uh, genome. And then when that phage came in again, they'd be able to recognize it and cut it using this cast protein. And so it acted as this sort of immune system for the bacteria against these viruses. So really, at the beginning, this was just something that was found in bacteria, and it seemed really cool. Um, but, you know, the way that it was being used at first was really in yogurt, um, that this was a natural system that the yogurt makers had sort of harnessed to make these phage resistant strains of yogurt bacteria that they could then sell to people, which was really cool. But it wasn't until a little bit later that uh, other scientists, including Doudna and Charpentier, thought, okay, well, is there a way to take this system that's naturally occurring in the bacteria and use it to do things that we want to do? And so they were the scientists who showed first in vitro that you could take these pieces of this CRISPR-Cas system, so you could take these little sort of wanted posters, and you could create your own and you could introduce something that they called a guide RNA. And so you could design it to specifically match up to a place of, or a piece of DNA that you wanted to cut. And you could take that cast cutting protein and you could put the two of these together in a tube and specifically cut a piece of DNA that you wanted to cut. And so that paper came out in 2012 uh, at the same time that actually another paper, and this is something a commenter on the first uh, video had brought up, Another group in Lithuania was finding something similar at the same time, and so their paper got hung up in peer review. Um, but so there were a couple of different groups who at the time were figuring out like, okay, we can gather this, uh, these two pieces, this cutting one, and we can create this guide RNA, and we can put them together, and we can go cut something. So that was 2012. And then in 2013, a group at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT Harvard and MIT showed that they could now do this in eukaryotic cells. So they then showed that, okay, you can do this in human cells and in mouse cells. And really, uh, those sorts of early pairs of papers in the 2012 and 2013 range sort of made this explode, where we, you know, scientists could now see like, all right, this isn't just something that we can use in bacteria. This is something that we can use to make specific DNA changes in, at this point, almost any organism that we want. It seems like every day there's another paper coming out about using CRISPR in a new species. And so this is really exciting and this is really cool. Um, and again, I talked about this a little bit in the first video, but the reason why this is cool, that making DNA cuts is really important, is because this is a really powerful tool to be able to figure out what a gene does at its most basic level. And so uh, again, if you have a car, and you open up the hood of the car and you don't know what any of this stuff inside does, you can take it out piece by piece and figure out what system in the car is broken and then you know that that piece that you took out is somehow involved in that system. So we can do the same thing with DNA where if we wanna figure out what every gene in E. coli does, we can break each gene one by one and see what happens to the E. coli and we can figure out then what processes those genes were involved in. So this is a super powerful tool for research. Um, we also, of course, could use this in medicine, and we'll talk about this a little bit later because I did get some questions about this, of if you have a mutation that causes a disease, could we now go in and in your DNA specifically cut out that mutation and somehow uh, try and fix that disease uh, if that's something that we want to fix, and we'll talk about that a little bit later too. And the answer seems to be yes, and there's some clinical trials using CRISPR now which are really cool. Um, additionally, the fact that CRISPR is sort of like a search and find tool for your genome, it means we can do a lot more than just cut it and break your DNA. We can also now cut a specific area and put in a piece of DNA that we want to do into a really specific place. Or what we can do is we can, you know, take away CRISPR's cutting abilities, but we can attach a fluorescent probe to it. And so now CRISPR can go in and find a specific piece of DNA and make it glow so you can figure out where in the cell that is. Or we can use CRISPR, there's now a bunch of people using CRISPR uh, in viral diagnostics to try and see, can we use CRISPR as a tool to try and diagnose things like COVID-19 rapidly and outside of the lab? So there are a lot of different applications of this ability to find and then cut or not cut a specific piece of DNA or RNA in the cell. And again, this started off with sort of one CRISPR-Cas system that people were looking at back in 2013 and 2012, but this is now something we found in lots of different types of bacteria so we now have 
sort of this whole toolkit of different uh, CRISPR-Cas proteins that do slightly different things and we can use in slightly different ways. And not only that, we, but we've been able to modify them in the lab to make them work in better in different ways so that we can do things like precise base editing and base switching. So really a revolutionary tool that has a thousand different paths we could take it on um, that is really, really cool. So yeah, Kimberly just asked, do all bacteria species have the system or only specific bacterial species? Uh, that's actually a great question. I know that many do, so there are many different types of CRISPR systems. It's not just in one species, but I don't want to go out on, I don't want to say that all of them do, because all is a very specific word, and I'm sure there's probably some out there that doesn't, but many of them do have this sort of viral immune system uh, using CRISPR. Um, so another quick question before we get into the big list that I have, how long does the guide RNA, how long is the guide RNA? So typically it's somewhere in the range of about 20 base pairs is the piece of guide RNA that's being used to find your target. So that can confer a lot of specificity if you're trying to find a specific location in a genome. So you have 20 base pairs about that you're playing with there that's trying to find a specific piece of DNA. There are four possible bases, A, T, C, and G, that can go into, or U because it's RNA, uh, A, U, C, and G that can go into that place. Um, so there's a mathematical number of exactly how many combinations there are that I can't do in my head right now. Um, but, you know, if you think about how many times that specific piece would show up in the genome, it's going to be pretty small. So you can get a pretty specific cutting. However, that doesn't mean that you might not get something called an off-target effect. And this is something we talk about a lot when we talk about CRISPR, is that if you have this guide RNA, is it possible that it's going to recognize a similar sequence somewhere else in the genome and make a cut someplace that you don't want it to? And the answer is yes, that is something that we are concerned about is these off-target effects. But there's been a lot of research that has gone into figuring out if you make, the longer essentially you make that guide RNA, the mathematically smaller the probability is that you're going to find these uh, matching regions. And also um, people have done a lot of work on figuring out like where in that 20 base pair sequence mismatches are more or less likely to bind to specific other places in the genome. So you can do a lot of modeling to figure out where these off-target effects might occur or are most likely to occur. And you can design guide RNAs and better CRISPR-Cas systems that can reduce the probability of getting those off-target target effects. So that is something that we are constantly thinking about, scientists are constantly trying to optimize for, is how do we reduce the possibility of these off-target effects. And we're not at the point where there are zero off-target effects yet, but in different systems we can get it down to a really, really low percentage. And we also are creating better surveillance systems to go into a genome that we've edited and figure out have there been off-target effects. So that's something that we definitely keep in mind is where else could we be cutting and looking for those places. Places. Um, somebody asked where I got my PhD from. That's a really easy question. I got my PhD in genetics from Stanford. So easy answer. Um, all right. So I want to dive into some of the questions that people have sent in for uh, beforehand now. Um, but please keep sending in your questions in the chat. And also as I'm talking, if something doesn't make sense, please stop me. Um, so one of the questions I got on Patreon was from Joshua Davis, who asked if CRISPR can be used to change the word, change the way that screw worms breed or migrate to lower their impact on livestock um, and also about other pests. And I chose screw worms to talk about because screw worms are a crazy story, the way that we have tried to control them over the years. So if you don't know what they are, they're a parasite that eat live flesh and i want to keep that as tame as possible but they're a really big ag agricultural pest um, and they can also affect humans as well so for decades now the way we've eradicated them uh to the best of my knowledge in i think there was another outbreak in florida but we've mostly eradicated them in north america and mexico uh, and moving down towards panama by creating breeding a bunch of screw worms uh, and then radiating males, and then taking those male, now sterile screw worms and dropping them out of a plane uh, over the panama Colombia border, I believe. So we're essentially creating like this wall 
weekly, we are weekly dropping those out of planes onto this border to uh, create a wall of sterile males so that females will breed with these sterile males and then we'll not have uh, more screwworm larva, babies, eggs. I don't know much about their reproductive cycle. But so this is a really cool and interesting technique that we've used. Um, but there has been some research done into, okay, can we use CRISPR to optimize this system? So rather than breeding them all, and then I believe we use x-rays to radiate them uh, to create these sterile males, can we use CRISPR to do this instead? And so I found a paper uh, from Paolo et al. that reported the first successful use of CRISPR-Cas9 in the New World screwworm fly. And so what they did is they actually haven't used it to create sterile screwworms yet, but what they did is they targeted a uh, color gene in these screwworms so that they could uh, very easily track just by looking at the screwworms whether or not their gene editing had worked. And they found that it was successful um, and that they could maintain that gene editing or that edited gene in a population for 15 generations, which demonstrated that the CRISPR-induced mutations were stable. So there is a lot of work going into pest control um, in things like screwworms, uh, tick populations, mosquitoes, radiate or irradiate, and what are the differences? Ooh. That's a great semantics question that I cannot answer for you without Googling. Uh, so maybe somebody else can Google that. Um, but they, because yeah, it's probably irradiated. Sorry. Um, so they are trying to use CRISPR in these and other pests to see if that's a possibility to manage them. And at the beginning, this is still very much a sort of proof of concept thing. It does, It is not in practice yet, but they have so far shown that yes, they can use a CRISPR-Cas system in the screwworms and they can keep those edits stable in a population for up to 15 generations. So that's pretty cool. And I think that that is sort of one strategy going forwards that might be used to try and control these populations, which is pretty cool. Um, oh, you're welcome for, for answering. That was a great question. I love, I've also put in uh, the description of this video below a bunch of links to uh, the sources that I looked up for talking about all of these answers. So if you want to read more about that story, I've put both a link to a great Atlantic story about what we're currently doing to control these populations and also a link to uh, a, I think a science news story about this paper that just came out uh, looking at the screwworm and another, what is this other fly? Uh, the Australian sheep blowfly. And so those are all down in the links below if you want to read any more later on. Um, oh, all right, Kevin. Irradiate, exposed to radiation, similar treat with radiation or x-rays. Okay, so it's irradiate, not radiate. My apologies. Um, uh, all right, so somebody in the chat just asked, are there limitations with CRISPR? And so... Oh yeah, radiate to spread from the center to the radius of something. Interesting. Uh, so there are a lot of limitations to CRISPR, and I think we're going to talk about that as we go through some more of these questions. But one of the ones that uh, I think is important to think about is that many of the questions that came in and that I'm seeing here too are about, you know, uh, oh, that Dan, you make a good point there, um, is that if you want CRISPR to work, in a cell. You have to get CRISPR to that cell to make a cut. Imagine trying to do that in a whole organism. It's really hard to get something to reach every single cell. And so, you know, I think in some of these sort of pop culture iterations of CRISPR, uh, and I am on an upcoming episode of, a, of the Bad Science podcast talking about CRISPR's usage in the movie Rampage, um, there are, there's this idea that, you know, you get one dose of CRISPR, you get like a whiff of CRISPR and suddenly every cell in your body is mutated. And that's really not how it works because you have to imagine that you have billions of cells and getting to each of them is going to be hard. And so a lot of the clinical trials using CRISPR that are in practice now are either uh, taking things like stem cells out of your body, modifying those cells with CRISPR and putting them back in, or reaching easily reached tissues. So one of the big uh, CRISPR trials, or it's not actually a big CRISPR trial, but one of the current CRISPR clinical trials is using it in a form of inherited blindness, where they're injecting a uh, CRISPR-containing viral vector into the, it's a subretinal injection, so they're injecting it into the eye. And one of the reasons why this is a 
good first trial of using CRISPR is that it's easy to reach your retina. I mean, your eye is kind of like a ball of jelly, and so it's Ooh, it seems scary, but it's easy to actually inject it into that location, whereas it's a lot harder to reach, say, every cell of your brain. So there are a couple of areas in the body that are kind of easy to reach. One of them is actually your liver, because your liver processes so much in your body that if you ingest something or if you get a shot of something or something's in your bloodstream, it's probably going to end up in the liver at some point. So the liver is also a target that I personally think will probably pop up in the next few years as something that we might be able to target with CRISPR just because it's easy to get stuff there. But if you want to, again, you know, you want to treat a neurodegenerative disorder, say, uh, I think that's going to be something that we'll see much farther in the future because reaching every cell of the brain is so much harder than reaching uh, something like your retina. Um, so, yeah, I think... That's one of the many limitations of CRISPR is that you have to be able to get it to the cells that you want to edit. And that can be difficult if we're thinking about future human applications. Also in the lab, again, off-target effects are another big limitation of CRISPR um, that is getting smaller every day as we get better with it. But I think that, you know, it's something to keep in mind that it is an incredibly precise DNA scalpel, but there are sometimes these off-target cuts. And so, uh, you know, it's something that you have to keep in mind and think about as a potential limitation. Um, okay, so Sergey on YouTube, I believe, uh, asked about using CRISPR to combat cancer. And so this is a really cool topic that I want to talk about because, again, some of the current CRISPR clinical trials are looking at um, cancer. And so I have a couple of slides here uh, that, oops, technology that I want to use to show this. And so this one is from cancer.gov. And so this is one of uh, an infographic of how some of these CRISPR clinical trials are working, where they first remove blood from a patient to get T-cells, which are a type of immune cell. They take those T-cells out, and then they insert uh, one gene, they cut another three genes, and then they take those CRISPR-edited T-cells, and they put them back essentially into a blood transfusion, and they put them back into the patient. Uh, it's a little fancier than just a blood transfusion. But the idea is that now, what they've done in that process is they've edited these T-cells to go and specifically find and kill cancer cells. So there's this method of doing this, um, and you may also hear of something called a CAR T uh, cell, stem cell, CAR T cancer clinical trial. So this is another similar idea of we're taking out cells from someone, we're editing them to go and attack cancer, and we're putting them back in someone. And so these are some of the clinical trials of CRISPR that are happening today. Uh, which is really, really cool that we've progressed to that point. So they're doing things like this for cancer, and they're also doing a similar treatment for some blood disorders, so things like sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemia, where uh, we're taking out stem cells from a patient, we're editing them to create a different kind of hemoglobin than those patients are currently producing, and then we're putting them back into the patient. And again, one of the reasons why we're taking it out is because it's hard to sort of get at those cells in a patient, whereas we can much more easily edit them in a dish and then put them back in the patient. But I think that, again, it's really cool to me that, you know, CRISPR as a tool to edit DNA was really just discovered eight years ago. And we're already now in clinical trials that are using it against things like cancer. So I think that that's going to be one of the earliest places where we see success just because we've already made such progress, which is really cool. Uh, oh, so Michael Harrison just asked, uh, is the most rec is most research using CRISPR for a single gene edit, or are we already at the point of making multiple non-adjacent edits? And so this is a really good question because when you think of, you know, you're adding in CRISPR and you're adding in a single guide RNA to some system, and I've talked a lot about humans so far today, but we also talked about screwworms, so it could be any organism. That one guide RNA is going to find and cut one place. But there are research groups who are now adding in um, 
multiple guide RNAs at a time to try and cut in multiple different places. Now there is an upper limit to this based on how you're introducing the CRISPR and the guide RNA to a cell or to a system. So again, one of the uh, current viral vectors that we're using, or one of the current vectors that we're using is a viral vector. So things like AAV viral vectors. And so these are uh, viruses that infect humans, but typically don't cause much of any sort of bad result. Um, and so are safe that we can sort of package uh, DNA into and then deliver it to a cell population or a tissue or an organism to try and have it infect that organism and deliver its RNA. So we're essentially hijacking a virus to give us a ride to where we want to go. And there's an upper packing limit on that. So I worked with AAVs in my PhD, and we typically had sort of a packaging limit of around 6,000 base pairs. And so to give you an idea, the cast protein, oh, I'm going to get this number wrong, but it's like a couple thousand base pairs long. Then you got to put the CRISPR, uh, the guide RNA in there. Then you got to put like a couple other things. And so you sort of reach that upper packaging limit pretty quickly. And so... Currently, what I've seen, um, again, if we're using this sort of viral vector, you know, you can get a few guide RNAs in there, but we are definitely not at a stage where you can make hundreds or thousands of cuts uh, at the same time. Unless, and I'm for those of you who are going to get me on the technical details, you could use something like a CRISPR-X to go in and make, you know, lots of different mutations in a population of cells all one kind of time. Um, but that's typically when we're thinking about going in and making really precise changes to a specific area, um, we're looking at a few, a handful of places all at one time, but we can package more than one. And actually that's, a. Uh, I talked briefly about the, uh, blindness studies that are happening right now, the clinical trials using CRISPR. And they're actually going in and they're using two guide RNAs to cut. Uh, here we've got these little PAM sequences, which is a function of the, it's a piece of the guide RNA. It's a sequence that it needs to recognize. And so they are making, in fact, two cuts around a mutation, cutting out that piece of DNA and then having the cell repair it so that now uh, these you can see these two areas are like closer together. Um, so they're cutting out a piece of the gene that has the mutation that's causing this blindness and then having those two pieces be sort of stuck back together by the cell uh, by using two different guide RNAs that are going in and cutting those two different locations. So one of the clinical trials right now is using two different guide RNAs to cut a piece, uh, which again, is pretty cool. Um, what is the difference between Cas proteins? Does CRISPR only use Cas9 or can it use other Cas proteins? Yeah, so Cas stands for CRISPR associated protein. And so the first one that was really described and used in the literature was Cas9 from S. pyogenes, uh, which is a type of bacteria. And this was really the first one. And I, I think still probably the most widely used CRISPR associated protein is Cas9. But now that we have found uh, the similar proteins in other uh, species and in other bacteria, there are lots of Cas proteins that are used right now that work in slightly different ways. Some target DNA, some target RNA. Um, we've modified some of them so that they actually don't cut and they can just go and find a piece of DNA and stick to it. So there are lots of Cas proteins that are in use right now, um, not just Cas9, but Cas9 is the most commonly used one. It's it's the most basic Cas protein, and we love it. Uh, but it is the standard issue Cas protein. If you're just trying to use CRISPR in the lab, you're probably using Cas9 at least as a, a first go. Um, all right, another question that I thought was very cool that came in from Andre Timishov. Um, is can targeted DNA methylation be used instead to turn off specific genes and get clues about their possible functions? So if you're not familiar with what DNA methylation is, it's like a little tag that your cell can put on some pieces of DNA to turn off a gene. So in our bodies, we have, with the exception of red blood cells, the same DNA in every single cell in our body but our cells look very different. They have different functions. They have different uh, ways that they work and things they need to do. So not every gene is turned on in every cell. So your, cell has, your cells have different ways of turning on or off different genes. And one of the ways that they do this is methylation. And so there are now, again, because we've modified it in lots of cool different ways, 
uh, some CRISPR uh, complexes where we've, again, attached one of those, uh, a DCAS9, so this is that deactivated dead Cas9, which can't cut, to some kind of protein that can affect methylation. So this is from uh, a recent science paper, and, or sorry, Science Direct, not Science the Magazine. Um, and so the DCAS9 is attached to this ROS1 uh, complex, and so it can go in and it can remove methylation from target genes and then allow those target genes to be turned on. So you can go in and you can turn on genes that were previously turned off without actually having to cut uh, that DNA. But that's not the only way that people are doing this. There's also things called CRISPR-A and CRISPR-I uh, for activation and inactivation um, complexes, which again, work in a really similar way where you have this DCAS9, which can go and bind to DNA, but not actually cut it. And then they're attached to, uh, again, proteins that will either activate or inactivate a certain gene. So they'll attach to some sort of effector region upstream and they'll turn a gene on or off selectively without you having to actually cut that gene. So yeah, to answer your question, yes, like we have ways of doing this, which are pretty cool where we don't actually have to cut the DNA, but we can go in and turn the DNA on or off in a specific region and turn those genes on or off to actually see uh, what happens and to figure out the function of the genes that way, which again, I think is pretty cool that, you know, this started off, oop, there are all my notes. Um, this started off as something that we were really just looking at as a pair of molecular scissors, but now they're not just molecular scissors. It's like really sort of a molecular Swiss army knife, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, another very good question. Uh, so another question that I got from Siegel uh, was asking about a novel called Change Agent by an author called Daniel Suarez. And the idea is that somebody is infected with a viral agent that changed their DNA in vivo so that he took on the appearance of a totally different person. And the question is, how likely is something like that to occur and take place in the future? And so my answer to that uh, at its most basic level is very unlikely. And again, part of this is because I was what because of what I was talking about before, where if you wanna change somebody's entire appearance, you have to get CRISPR to every cell in their body that you can see, and that's really hard. Um, but I wanted to take a slightly more specific example and think about hair color. So what if I wanted to use CRISPR to become a blonde instead of bleaching my hair? Could I do that? And again, this would be really hard to do because I would have to get CRISPR to every single one of my hair cells um, or the hair follicle cells that are generating my hair and giving it its color. And I would have to change all of the different genes that affect that hair color. Because I, th I think a thing that we don't stress enough is that there are very few genetic traits um, and also not all diseases that are caused by just a single gene or just a single change in your DNA. So for hair color, there are, I believe, at least 10 or 11 different genes that all contribute a little bit to the color of your hair and the texture of your hair and whether or not it's curly or straight. And so you would again have to somehow get the Cas protein and a number of different guide RNAs to all make different cuts in all the cells of all my hair follicles to get my hair to go from brown to blonde uh, using CRISPR. Much easier just to go out and buy some bleach. Um, so really, it's not something that we can see as something where I could, you know, take a viral shampoo and shampoo my hair and suddenly get blonde hair. I think that that is still a really big stretch of sci-fi um, and a cool thing. Like, I think sci-fi is cool. I think it allows us to explore a lot of these questions, but it's still a really uh, far way down the road. Um, ooh, hello, James. Uh, so fun fact, we are looking at how CRISPR changes phage therapy in CF patients. So we still don't really know how and why bacteria decide to use CRISPR as a resistance mechanism. And that's a great point. Um, and I have family members with CF, so I didn't know you were doing that research and that's super cool. Um, but yeah, it's, again, it's still something that there is this field has exploded. There is so much research happening in it right now, which is really, really cool. Um, but we don't have the answers to all that kind of stuff. We don't always know the how or the why, and we're still trying to figure that out. But for me, that was super fun. 
um, because being in genetics and being in research at this time where we were trying to figure all of these things out was a blast. Um, and I did not study CRISPR, but I did use CRISPR at a few points in my uh, PhD to try and do things in the lab. And it was just amazing that, you know, you get this little plasmid of DNA and you can try and make, you can edit a genome. That's really cool to me. Um, Altered Carbon sounds much more plausible than other sci-fi novels. I haven't actually read Altered Carbon, so I don't know. But I'm, I'm always looking for book recommendations, so maybe I'll add that to the list. Um, is there any concern of the body rejecting modified cells? Question from Roman. I'm going to kind of flip that question on its head uh, and connect that to another question that I got from C. That was the only username that asked, uh, can CRISPR be used to regenerate damages? And so... When we think about trying to do uh, regeneration research, um, so there are a number of different animals that can regenerate, right? You can imagine thinking about a lizard losing a limb and then regrowing that limb or a starfish or I guess a lizard losing its tail. Um, so there's a lot of work going into regeneration where we might use things like stem cells to uh, try and regenerate uh, a limb or maybe a nerve or something. Um, again, still very far off. But one of the ways that CRISPR uh, is being proposed to uh, work in tandem with that and to help that research is to try and prevent rejection. So CRISPR could actually be used, rather than the concern of the body rejecting the modified cells, we can actually use CRISPR to try and uh, prevent rejection for things like, you know, lab-grown tissues. You know, could we use CRISPR to modify the you know antigens and the immune signals uh, in response to those lab-grown things that we could then give back to people. So of course, if we are modifying a cell, we would want to uh, look and make sure that there's no rejection issue. But the cool thing about these, talking in a circle here, the cool thing about these clinical trials is that they're using the patient's own cells. So the patient's body should not reject their own cells. We're modifying just one little piece of it, uh, but we should not be modifying the sort of self-recognition proteins in the self-recognition system. So this could be a great way to sort of do, it's almost, it's not quite self-transplantation, but you're taking the cells out from someone and then you're putting them back in. So there should be a much lower chance of rejection, but we could also use it in other scenarios to specifically modify uh, those self-receptor proteins to try and reduce rejection in other scenarios. So could be very cool. Uh, okay. A couple more questions from here. Um, I did mention in the first video the ethical implications a little bit of using CRISPR in things like clinical trials on consenting patients versus the sort of 2018 birth of two uh, twin girls who had been gene edited as embryos. And so I just got a couple questions on that, so I don't want to spend a long time on that. But the idea really is that there's a fundamental difference between editing genes in someone that will only stay in them versus editing something known as a germline cell. So these are things like sperm and eggs that can then go on to pass those changes on to future generations um, and doing work in things like embryos. And so there's been a lot of discussion in the scientific community about whether or not we should or should not do that work and the sort of qualifications that need to be met before we do that. Because again, there are things like these off-target effects that we need to be concerned about that we are making great strides on, but aren't perfectly uh, totally resolved at this point. Um, and uh, suffice to say, the work that was done in 2018 um, by uh, He Zhang Kui, uh, who is a scientist in China, was not done correctly. It did not meet these criteria, um, both because there were some ethical issues around how he consented patients, um, he seemed to have forged some documents to try and push this research through, uh, and the changes that he made were not great. So one of the uh, twins that was born was actually chimeric, so she had different changes in the two copies of her... Uh, it looked like she had different cell populations that might have different changes made in them by this CRISPR therapy. And in the other twin, um, there were also different changes that were made. Uh, there were changes made to one copy of the gene, but not the other. So there were a lot of problems with this work. Um, again, this could be its own hour-long discussion, 
However, the point that I want to make here is that there were already guidelines in place from the scientific community. And the ones that I pulled up uh, right here are from 2017 from the American Society of Human Genetics that said that uh, at this time, given the nature and number of unanswered scientific, ethical, and policy questions, it is inappropriate to perform germline editing uh, that culminates in human pregnancy. A whole bunch of other things. And then future clinical application of human germ germline genome editing should not proceed unless at a, min at a minimum there is a compelling medical rationale, an evidence base that supports its clinical use, an ethical justification, and a transparent public process to solicit and incorporate stakeholder input. So these are the guidelines that were in place in 2017 from just one um, society. So this was ASHG, the American Society of Human Genetics. But a new report has just come out uh, from the International Commission on the Clinical Use of Human Germline Genome Editing uh, that was formed in 2018. And this report just came out in September. It is 225 pages long, so we're not going to go through all of it. But they lay out really strict criteria for what needs to be met before we even try and do this and what kinds of conditions this could be used potentially on. Um, and so they have a whole bunch of different recommendations. Again, I've linked that in the description below if you do want to read all 225 pages, uh, as well as some summary articles. There's a great one from Stat News if you just want sort of an overview. But the idea uh, is that the first recommendation is that germline editing should not proceed until it has been clearly established that it is possible to efficiently and reliably make precise genomic changes without undesired changes in human embryos. And we haven't met that criteria yet, and so currently we should not proceed with this. And then they also list a whole bunch of guidelines where once that criteria has been met, how do we decide uh, which conditions this should or should not be used on. And so some of the guidelines that they set forth are that there should be no other way of ensuring a couple can produce embryos without the disease causing genetic variants. Um, they have a number of different criteria for the guidelines of what those kinds of conditions could be. Um, but again, 225 pages, I can't summarize all of it here. But the thing that I think is really important to think about is that there are groups who are thinking about this. And there are people who are laying out what these guidelines should be and looking into the fact that we are at a time where this is happening, whether or not it should or should not be happening. And we need to be discussing what those guidelines should be for moving forwards. And I think this uh, commission seems to do a good job of this, but I also want to stress that I don't think that these are guidelines that should just be written by scientists. I really think that we need everyone to come together and talk about this. So we should have scientists talking about this. We should have policymakers talking about this. But I think it's also really impatient to have, or important to have patients talking about this, to have caregivers talking about this, and to have the communities that it will affect talking about this. And so, you know, somebody uh, left a comment on the first video talking about how the fact that the fact that they have autism and that they're worried about people trying to fix autism when there are a lot of members of the autism community who don't think it's something that needs to be fixed, who don't want to be fixed and find it, you know, insulting that that's a way that people would talk about the way that they experience the world. And so I think it's really important that we listen to those communities um, and have them be a part of the conversation because I think that, you know, there are sometimes people who have good intentions who see a problem and want to fix it when the people who are experiencing that don't want it to be fixed and don't see it as a problem. So I think that that's really important uh, to be talking with these communities and to have these conversations and to inform people about what the technology is so that everybody feels comfortable participating in these conversations and feeling like they understand the vocabulary and that they can go forward, forwards and talk about that. Because again, I think that we can't, we can't make decisions about this without including everybody, um, especially things like, you know, germline editing that wouldn't just affect the person they were edited in. They will affect many generations that gene edit will be passed down. So I was a whole bunch to say that there are a lot of people who are thinking about this, a lot of people who are looking at guidelines for when we should be able to proceed with this, what we should proceed with it on. And I just think this is a wider conversation that we all need to be having um, about when we want to use this and when it's appropriate to use this and when it's not appropriate to use this. So there are a lot of people who are thinking about this is what I want to reassure you about, that it's not just... <laughs> 
every scientist for themselves, there are people who are trying to figure out what these guidelines are and what they should be moving forwards. Um, all right, I want to take a second just to look at some of these questions in the chat. Uh, what about germline editing for mosquitoes or other species specifically pests? So yeah, this is actually a really cool thing. So broadly, not just thinking about CRISPR, there are a number of groups who are trying to use a bunch of different biological techniques to create uh, sterile male usually sterile male mosquitoes that you release into a population uh, that then go on and breed with female mosquitoes to reduce the population because those female mosquitoes can't then go on and produce eggs. So this is being tried in a number of different places. Uh, there are, I'm pretty sure, uh, places in Fresno where they've been trying this with uh, some certain types of mosquitoes. There are, I believe, places in Brazil, maybe some places in Florida where we're trying to do this to try and reduce uh, the population of mosquitoes that spread things like West Nile virus, um, Zika was a big thing, um, and malaria. So I think that this is a really cool uh, biological technique and there are now groups who are trying to do this with CRISPR as well, whereas before there were some that were uh, infecting these with Wolbachia uh, as KH by just brought up um, to try and make these sterile mosquitoes. So there are a number of different strategies that have been moving forwards and I do believe people are trying to use CRISPR for this now as well. Uh, and again, I think this is a place where there's a lot of great potential here, but we also need to make sure we're talking with the communities where we're releasing these things. Um, similarly, there's a group on Martha's Vineyard in Nantucket that's trying to use CRISPR or thinking about using CRISPR modified mice to try and reduce the tick population there to reduce the spread of Lyme disease. And so I think these are all really cool initiatives and really great ways where we might be able to reduce the number of people who are getting these diseases that can have really serious uh, impacts. And so, yeah, the research is in progress. It's still going. I don't, I'm pretty sure that all of these are still sort of in the study phase versus in the just like, yes, we're done. We're releasing it everywhere phase. Um, I know that Verily is, I believe, uh, the debug program at Verily is the one that's working up in Fresno, uh, which has these like vans that go out and release these mosquitoes. So it's cool. And I think I'm really excited to see the data as it comes in from all of these experiments because there are more of them popping up, including some that are using CRISPR. So, okay, yes, malaria is a parasite. The gene edited mosquitoes are in incapable of carrying that parasite. Um, and yeah, so uh, Jim the Evo brings up gene drives, which I don't want to spend too much time on today, but the idea of a gene drive is that you have uh, essentially a type of CRISPR cassette in a population that will spread itself to other copies of the genome. So if it's in one copy of the genome that you get from, you know, a mom mosquito or a dad mosquito, um, it can spread it to the other copy and then sort of propagate itself forwards through a population, which is really cool, uh, theoretically. Um, but there are, of course, with anything, there are questions about, you know, what is this going to mean environmentally? Um, and uh, how could this have an environmental impact? Because once you put something like a gene drive out there, it's very hard to get it back. Um, so I think they're really cool. I think they have a lot of potential. Apparently there's a Kurzgestatt video about it, which is super cool. They do an amazing job. Um, and so I haven't seen it, but would recommend you go watch that video because I trust the information that they put out there. Um, so yeah, it's a really cool, really cool technology. Um, but, and again, I'm really interested to see sort of how that research plays out and where things move forward with that in the future, because if we can show that we can use it uh, appropriately and very safely, I think it could have a big impact on things like malaria spreading mosquitoes. Um, other questions? Uh, this is, so this is kind of a silly question um, that Zombie Brain Studios sent in asking if CRISPR could help raise an army of undead giant space hamsters. And I know this sounds ridiculous, but I do want to talk through uh, ways that this could or could not work. Because I think, again, sometimes these, you know, I talked about how we're not making unicorns, but I think sometimes these sort of fantastical examples are really good to talk about the limitations of some of these uh, technologies. So the first thing here is if you want to have sort of zombie space hamsters, CRISPR, when you think about it, requires a cell that it's in to be alive. 
because if CRISPR goes in and it cuts a piece of DNA, actually the way that it prevents that DNA from working is because when the cell repairs that DNA, uh, it usually inserts a little typo, it might leave sort of a genetic scar that will prevent that uh, gene from going on to create a functional protein or the correct level of protein. Um, so first of all, your giant space hamsters can't be undead because their cells would need to be alive to actually uh, do that sort of repair mechanism and keep that, uh, that hamster doing stuff. Um, but what about just giant space hamsters? So the giant part is actually the next part that I think is kind of cool, is that one of the uh, things that people have talked about with CRISPR is this gene called myostatin. So myostatin is a gene involved in your muscles. Um, it helps figure out how, uh, it helps, it responds to growth hormone, and so it controls some of the growth of your muscles very simply. And so there are animals who have mutations in myostatin they get very big muscles. So you can look this up. They create things like hypermuscular cows and dogs. So they look like, if you imagine a cow that has been going to like bodybuilding classes, like cows who have certain mutations in myostatin are like really tough cows. Um, so could you potentially use CRISPR to make a mutation in uh, a mouse myostatin gene and get, or excuse me, hamster myostatin gene and get these really beefy hamsters. And it is possible, right? Especially if you were doing this in sort of an embryo stage of a mouse, you could potentially, hamster, not mice, my apologies, tiny rodents, um, you could potentially create uh, really beefy hamsters. So the giant part, I'm gonna give you, you could create some giant hamsters, um, potentially. Uh, space hamsters, I mean, I'm gonna say that hamsters are still probably always gonna need to breathe air, so just floating around out there, no, but like if you give them a little spacesuit, maybe. So again, one of those things where I think it's a silly example, but thinking about, you know, trying to create a really strong hamster is probably something that we could do um, because we know that there are some genes where a single mutation, a single genetic edit could have this large effect because we have this prior research in things like cows and dogs who have myostatin mutations. Um, and again, I bring that up uh, just because it's kind of a silly example, but it is one where you could probably make, I mean, relatively giant, like we're not gonna make a person-sized hamster, but you could make like a large hamster, potentially. Um, and also again, because, uh, again, it hasn't come out yet. I can't wait until it comes out, but I was on this, uh, bad science podcast talking about rampage where they make, you know, King Kong sized gorillas. And that is probably out of the question, even with myostatin mutations, but you know, a large hamster possible. Um, Sandcastle also brought up the fact that who would have thought a pair of yogurt factory scientists would almost change the world. And I do believe that that's like an amazing thing that I think this is like a, a beautiful story of how science happens, that people did not set out to go and find a, you know, find a bacterial immune system that they could use as this molecular tool. That was not the goal of the research. The goal of their research was to look at their yogurt bacteria strains and figure out, can we use this to make better yogurt? Um, and how can we sort of make the yogurt creating process easier? And that research led to really revolutionary world changing tools. So I think that is super cool. And I think that's just such like a beautiful story that often doesn't get told about CRISPR. I feel like when people talk about CRISPR, they start at Doudna and Charpentier a lot. Um, but this came from yogurt biologists. And so I just think that that's like a wonderful story of how science actually happens and how science is actually done. Um, so yeah, I think that's really cool. I think that's sort of a lovely, a lovely point about CRISPR is that it came from this research and also is a really good point for why basic research is really important because you don't always go into research knowing what's going to come out of it on the other end. And some of the biggest, like most revolutionary things we have came from basic research that wasn't, you know, going to try and figure out like, well, we're trying to cure cancer with this one thing. It came from somewhere else and the research evolved and we figured out more about the world around us and how it works and these hidden immune systems and bacteria could then go on to do this whole thing. So 
I think that's really cool. But I do think, again, one of the reasons why I love the fact that Doudna and Charpentier got the Nobel Prize is that they saw the possibility of this research and they turned it into this cool tool. And I think taking that step is big. And I, I don't know, I, I could only dream to be as creative and intelligent and smart to be able to see one thing and then you know see that next step and see its potential like I hope that I have such a creative idea one day so I think that's really cool um and yeah it's a part of the story that I love and yeah CRISPR is the future but CRISPR is also the now like we are using this currently every day in research um and in education and in clinical trials for medicine and in uh, diagnostics for things like COVID. Um, and so CRISPR is the future, but CRISPR is also the now. And I think that's really, really cool. Um, and yeah, I think Justin, I think you make a good point. So a lot of people dis contributed to this discovery, but Doudna and Charpentier were really the champions of CRISPR. I actually, again, in sort of preparing for this, I tried to steep myself in CRISPR media. And so I was listening to a podcast this morning while I was walking the dog. Um, with Doudna talking about the fact that she really made it a point once she realized the possibility of this to go out and talk about it and, you know, to try and introduce people to the idea of what it is. And so she started the Integrative Genomics Institute, um, the IGI, which is really cool. And you should go check out. They've got an amazing web page with all kinds of resources. Um, but yeah, I think I think for me, I mean, I'm a science communicator. I love talking about science, but I think it's so important to have the scientists talking about it too, especially if you have something that can be so revolutionary and so life-changing. Like it is huge um, to have scientists go out and talk about their research. It's really important because, I mean, I personally think that if you don't, if you can't talk about the science that you've done, there's no point in having done it because, and that can mean different things. You have to, if you do science, you have to be able to tell it to other scientists, and that can mean writing a paper or going to a conference. Um, that is really important. You have to tell people about what you've done or they can't build on it. But I think for something like this, it's also really important to go out and talk to society about it. Again, because as we're making decisions about this moving forwards, we need everybody to participate. We really need everybody to uh, think about this going forward. So yeah, I, I do really appreciate that she was a big champion of this. Um, and also in that podcast, I found out she wrote a book. How did I not know that she wrote a book? And I immediately ordered it this morning. So hopefully more science book reviews coming soon. Um, Jason just said, it seems that CRISPR is more often utilized in animals than in plants. Is there a reason behind this? I actually don't have stats on what that percentage is, but it is commonly used in plants. Um, there's a whole, again, we could talk for another hour about sort of genetically modified organisms and CRISPR being used in agriculture, but I just listened, again, I'm going to tell you about more podcasts. Uh, I just listened to the Gastropod podcast on CRISPR, and they were talking about uh, CRISPR being used in things like ground cherries, which are kind of a tomato-like organism, to be able and make changes that make them easier to grow and easier to harvest in a couple of years versus traditional breeding, which would take that something like, you know, a decade or two decades to sort of more traditionally breed organism or breed plants together. Whereas now you can really specifically go in and make changes and do this very quickly. Um, so I think it is being used pretty commonly in plants now too. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't have specific stats on exactly what percentage of plants have been modified by CRISPR and which ones or what percentage of animals. But yeah, I mean, it's being used in a ton of different species, including plants and animals and bacteria. Um, it's really, really cool. Uh, how do you build or design a guide sequence? Do you build it in the lab or buy it from an outside company? This is a great question because I think it really gets to the heart of why CRISPR is so easy to use that you just need a text file on your computer. So if you know the genome of the thing you're trying to cut and you have figured out that you want to cut in a certain region, that is a text file. That is an ATCG text file of what that place that you want to cut looks like or what that gene looks like. And there are a number of computational tools right now that you can use to find out what the uh, most optimum region in that area would be to design this guide. So you're optimizing for a bunch of different things. You're optimizing against uh, these off-target effects. You're optimizing for regions that have Again, this PAM sequence, which is just a little sequence that the CRISPR needs to recognize or the Cas protein needs to recognize. Um, but there are a ton of 
free and available programs you can use to develop this. And then you just need to order that piece of DNA, that little guide RNA sequence from a company. There are lots of companies who make this. And of course, you have to put that into a plasma. You have to get it into a delivery system somehow. You have to think about how you're getting both the Cas9 and the guide RNA into whatever you want to modify. But really designing it, like that actual building and designing is as easy as modifying a text file and sending it off to a company that will put those string those little a's t's c's and g's together for you um and that really is a cheap process i mean we used to order oligos like that for under 100 bucks in the lab which sounds expensive now that i'm not in the lab anymore but in lab money research is expensive that's pretty cheap um so that process is pretty straightforward and easy to do versus the tools that came up before CRISPR. So things like talons and zinc finger nucleases, where you had to essentially build specific proteins for each little place you wanted to cut. And that was very expensive. It was bulky. It was slow. Um, so going from that, where it's a lot of money, I mean, thankfully, people had almost stopped using those by the time I got to grad school. I never used one. Um, but yeah, it took like a month for the company to get it back to you, whereas you can order a guide RNA and probably get it the next day, depending on how close you are to the facility. So it's made it so much cheaper, so much more efficient, and so much easier to use because you just got to send them a text file, which is pretty cool. Um, okay, yeah, Cas9 endonuclease is almost being left behind already by others like Cas12A. And so, yeah, I totally agree. Oh, yeah, IDT. I love IDT. Um, they're one of the places that has pre-designed uh, oligos for guide RNAs, or you can order your own from IDT. That's where we ordered all of our oligos. Um, but yeah, again, like I think, I think that's the important thing is that you know we think of Cas9 and guide RNAs, but that was just the beginning. The number of different Cas proteins we found, the number of different modifications people have made to it, we've really opened this up to a whole world of new tools and new discoveries. Um, so yeah, it's it's moving fast. Um, how could you use CRISPR to determine if a certain disease has a genetic origin? It seems like there would be a long change of cause effects from DNA to disease. Michael, you are correct. Um, and this is one of the coolest things about research is that you know you're always constantly building evidence for something. So one of the again one of the ways we figure out what a gene does is we break it and we see what happens. But in the clinic, so I worked in a lab that did a lot of translational work where we would sometimes, you know, see patients who had a new mutation that we had never seen before. And we had to figure out, was that mutation causative for the disease that they had? Or was that just some unrelated mutation that they had? Because we all have mutations in our genome. You know, mutation is kind of a scary word. And I try and use variant. I try and use variant when I talk about it because it's a much less scary word. Um, but it just means, you know, we all have different variations in our genome that either we've inherited from our parents or that have happened new in us. So if you look at a person, you can't just say really easily that specific mutation has caused their disease. So what we do is we can do a number of things in the lab to try and figure out like, okay, well, does this mutation cause that disease? And again, before CRISPR, this was really hard to do. Creating a specific mutation in say a cell culture mo model or in a yeast was hard. Um, but now what we can do is if, you know, let's say that I have a mutation in my, I'm looking at a plant, in my plant gene, I have a mutation in my plant gene and so I'm growing a plant out of my head. I, this is a weird example. Um, what we could do is we could take some of my cells uh, in the lab or we could take cells from somebody else in the lab and in a dish we could use CRISPR to cut the plant gene and to insert the same mutation that I have and see, okay, do these cells in the dish with that mutation grow the plant and without the mutation not grow the plant? Um, what a weird example I just decided to choose uh, for that. But using CRISPR, we can make specific mutations in models. So these can be in cell culture, these can be in bacteria, these can be in mice. We can cut the gene in mice and put in that specific mutation that I have in their plant gene and see, does the mouse grow a plant? Um, so CRISPR really lets us do this much easier. And so in that determination process, there are a lot of steps. So, you know, you'll want to see uh, first, at just a modeling uh, step, you can say, okay, well, 
do we suspect that this specific change is going to have any impact on the RNA that this gene produces? Do we suspect that it's going to have an impact on the protein it produces? And then we can go and look at that. So I'll put in a plug for one of my papers from my PhD was a new method of looking to see if a specific change uh, in this patient that we had never seen before changed how her RNA was spliced together. And in fact, it did. Um, and so, you know, we can look at it at the RNA level, we can look at it at the protein level, we can look at it at a whole cell level, we can look at it at a model organism level. And so we have all of these different pieces of evidence that we pull together to finally be able to say, okay, we have some level of confidence that this variant that you have is what is causative for your disease. And that can be really important for a patient because that can both down the road allow us to look at potential therapeutics. And maybe these are genetic therapeutics, but this can also be a small molecule therapeutic that says like, okay, you know, you have a mutation in this gene and we know that drug X modulates how that gene works. And so we're going to try and give you that drug. Um, it can also be really beneficial diagnostically. So if you have a patient and you have pretty good evidence that the variant that you see in them is causative for disease, you can do what's called cascade screening. And so this is where we screen your first degree relatives uh, to see if they also have that same mutation um, and see if they might also be at risk for developing this disease. And so that can be really important, you know, for finding a disease early in those other family members or for, again, things like going forward and thinking about having children. Um, you know, if you have a mutation that is recessive, um, you know, and you want to see if your partner also has that mutation before you have children, that's something we can do and sort of... Uh, sort of pre-pregnancy genetic testing. So there are a lot of different steps in there, but CRISPR is really cool because now we can go in and really quickly and easily make those mutations in these models so that we can look and see, does this variant have an effect? Um, ooh, and CRISPR-based antibiotics. Uh, there are a whole bunch of CRISPR-based antibiotics that people are thinking about using. So if you think about antibiotics are amazing. They have saved millions of lives. Um, but we are developing, you know, we've used them a lot. Uh, we are developing because of that. There are strains of antibiotic resistant bacteria that are evolving. That's what I was trying to say. So there are people who are trying to use CRISPR to create, uh, antibiotics that could be specific to a certain type of bacteria. So perhaps you could take this antibiotic and not also kill all the healthy bacteria in your gut, um, which is, you know, one of the bad side effects of taking antibiotics now is that often, you know, you can have some GI symptoms because you've also taken this nonspecific antibiotic that kills all your other good healthy gut bacteria. Um, so people are trying to use CRISPR to create uh, specific antibiotics that could go in and just target the strain of bacteria that you're looking at. So I don't have any specific notes about that yet, so I don't want to say anything wrong. But yes, there are people working on CRISPR-based antibiotics, and I think that that is a huge potential avenue for antibiotics because trying to find a new one in lab or trying to find one in nature is a long, long, arduous process. So if we can just design one with CRISPR, that would be much cooler. Um, so we're about 10 minutes past when I thought we were going to stop now, um, and I don't want to babble on forever, uh, also because... I now need water. But please keep sending uh, questions in if you have them. Um, I'm happy to keep answering these questions in the comments of this video for the next couple of days. I'll try and be pretty active in there and answering them. Uh, and I also do try and always go back and answer questions on old videos too if people leave them. So yeah, I this had no structure and I just babbled about CRISPR and your questions for an hour and 10 minutes. So I hope that you learned something. I hope this was helpful and I hope I answered some of your questions. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining me. Um, if you're still interested in this, uh, I've put a bunch of links in the description below about more CRISPR resources. Um, and, you know, hopefully those can be additional further reading if you want to read it. I'll keep answering questions. Uh, there's going to be this podcast coming out, which is soon. There might be another video in the works that is coming out soon. So I'll keep adding CRISPR resources for me down there as well. Um, and as always, you can find me across a bunch of social medias. So I'm here on YouTube. But, you know, I post pretty infrequently. I'm sure you've noticed that. Uh, so I'm also on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. And now I'm on TikTok where I post almost every day. So if you want more of me babbling about science, you can find me on any of those platforms. The username is just my name, uh, Alex Danis, in any of those places. Um, and I'm telling you this now so that you can hold me accountable to actually doing it. 
is that this was sort of a surprise video and a surprise live stream because the CRISPR Nobel was announced. But I've been planning on doing another science news series where I do a short video and then a live stream about mRNA vaccines for things like COVID-19. So uh, I just did last week a whole hour long webinar with mini PCR bio about sort of an overall look at what are vaccines and how they're being used and developed against COVID-19. But I want to do one on my own just specifically talking about mRNA vaccines because they are one of the candidates that look like they're going to be coming out of clinical trials soon. And I've already gotten a lot of questions about them across uh, social platforms. So if you're interested in that, let me know, because uh, that will motivate me to actually create and upload those videos. Um, so hopefully there'll be one of those again coming soon. And yeah, thank you so much for joining me today. You sent in so many great questions. This was wonderful. Uh, I hope to do another one of these soon. And until then, uh, wash your hands, wear your mask, uh, get a flu shot, and vote. If you are in the United States and you're an eligible, eligible voter, uh, make sure that you vote. So thank you all for joining me. Go forth, do science, and yeah, CRISPR. CRISPR is amazing, and I love it. Uh, bye.